Good morning and welcome all once again to another intriguing wildlife chat. It's a privilege to have you join us today as we will be discussing a very intriguing topic, chasing reptiles in the islands of gods and dragons, organized by Classic Travel, your trusted travel partner and advisor for all outbound travel services. Before we get started with the webinar, let's go over the house rules. If you wish to ask a question, please use the chat option. You may post your question on the chat at any point of the session and they will be answered as we progress along with our webinar. To host this webinar, we are happy to introduce our very own acclaimed wildlife photographer, Rajiv Velikala. He has been a tour leader with over 20 years in photography and travel in Sri Lanka and the world over. He is currently working at Classic Travel, where he is heading the inbound wildlife and luxury travel experiences. And he also leads specialized wildlife tours worldwide. He held his debut solo exhibition in 2013, titled Wildlife Diaries, and in 2015, launched his first coffee table publication titled Children of Eden. He's a regular contributor to newspapers and magazines in Sri Lanka. And now we would like to welcome our very special guest, Dr. Ruchira Somavira, who is a Sri Lankan born herpetologist and evolutionary biologist with a broad research interest on how reptiles adapt to a changing world. He's a national geographic explorer and a science educator. Dr. Ru's current research subjects range from sea snakes in the Indian Ocean to crocodiles in remote Kimberley outback of Australia to reptiles of Komodo National Park in Indonesia, to the endemic horned lizards in the high mountains of Sri Lanka. Dr. Ru's work has led to numerous scientific papers, four books on herpetology, several children's and citizen science publications, and has been showcased nationally and internationally. Currently, he serves as a research scientist at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, and is actively involved in inspiring the next generation of biologists through the STEM professionals in school program of the Australian government. Welcome gentlemen, we are ready to start. Rajiv, over to you. Hello everyone, and I hope you all are keeping well this morning. Uh, welcome to another edition of Wild Insights. We are honored to have Dr. Ruchira with us, fondly known as Dr. Ru. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ru, for uh, you know joining with us. You truly made Sri Lanka proud with the great work you're doing and taking your work to the international level. And uh, I've followed your work for a very long time. But uh, for the benefit of the audience, would you like to uh, let us know how your interest in herpetology uh, was uh, started? Huh. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks Rajiv, thanks for organizing this and uh, having me. Uh, it's an indeed pleasure. Uh, herpetology wise, so I have been always keen on things, uh, things alive since I could move. So I've been keen on animals since I was a very young age. Um, specifically on herpetofauna, I think my, my the trigger was reading a set of newspaper articles by the veteran Sri Lankan herpetologist Anselm De Silva. This is when this was in a, a paper called Vidusara a long time ago, okay. and he wrote a whole series of uh, articles on Sri Lankan snakes. That was my first Bible. So I used to read that as a young kid. And uh, when I was at Trinity, uh, my high school, uh, we had a principal who was an uh, ex uh, head of the Department of Zoology, Professor Karen Breckenridge, and he was very supportive of biology. So that was that was the first actual push for science. Um, I managed to, um, I was actually privileged to get a job in IUCN um, as a field assistant during my school time, uh, where I met some some of the uh, leading herpetologists in our country now, uh, Mendy Swikuma Singer, Dr. Chana Babradenia, um, Samantha Suranjan, and quite a few other people. Those were my first teachers per se. Uh, but that, that triggered the actual science. And from then I have been absolutely keen on studying reptiles, but more so the ecology of them and the behavior and more so, and also understanding how reptiles adapt to a changing world. So that took me from uh, University of Pera then here um, to uh, University of Cambridge and then a couple of uh, summer schools with Harvard. 
And then I came to Australia for my PhD at University of Sydney and then uh, a postdoc at CSIRO. And now I'm working uh, for the National Institute as a researcher. But um, overall, all my work is focused on reptiles, um, right. but more specifically on how reptiles change in uh, how re reptiles live in a changing world. OK, so that's amazing and it's very inspirational, especially for a lot of the uh, young uh, up and coming uh, uh, what you know, uh, herpetologists and uh, people who are interested in that field also uh, how, how how you have come come so far. And uh, so you've been you uh, with your work, you traveled the world over and uh, I think Bali and Komodo in Indonesia, some of your favorite places to travel to as well. So we'll be talking today about your experiences and uh, the amazing things you can see. So over to you, doctor, uh, to show showcase to us uh, what what we can see there. Thanks, Rajiv. Um, so yeah, so our, my work um, has been going on um, in quite a few countries, but my one, two of my favorite places are Bali and Komodo, which which are two Indonesian islands. So today we'll go on a journey. We'll have a glimpse of what the mm -hmm. area offers, and we'll discuss how you can get there and uh, do some of this work with us. Yeah. Now, let's uh, let's start with Bali. And um, so Bali belongs to the archipelago of Indonesia. Now, a lot of people don't realize how big Indonesia is. There are 17,500 plus islands out of which about 6,000 of them are inhabited. Imagine that, imagine a country that's, that's that vast. So there are five major islands. You have Sumatra, Borneo, uh, Sulawesi, Java, and Papua. But there are so many other small islands. Now, among these, in the center is Bali, which is here. Just to put uh, just to put a size in context, Bali is only about 150 kilometers wide and about 5,000 square kilometers. That's the size of district of Anuradhapura if you compare in Sri Lanka. So we are talking about a com quite a small area. So if you get closer, Bali has this very weird shape, and it also have a satellite set of islands called the Nusa Islands. So for the last five years, I have been traveling in Bali and studying um, and getting to get to know this place, plus studying things in Bali and also Nusa Penida. So let's let's go on a very quick trip and see what my experiences were. When you hear about Bali, a lot of people think about a party town, and for many Australians, that's the case. Like there are, there, there, it's a very cheap location when it, when it comes when, in the bigger picture um, to go and party. But that's only a tiny part of Bali. A large part of Bali is absolutely beautiful. It's quite, it's quite scenic. Ba Bali or that part of Indonesia belongs to the Ring of Fire, which is a set of uh, a line of volcanoes. So all these islands are volcanic in origin. That means the, the soil is so fertile. So agriculture is a huge thing, especially paddy farming is huge. And, um, and as you can see, because it's such a hilly country, you have this um, all the slopes are now cleared for um, paddy farming. Bali is densely populated, but these people are beautiful, absolutely welcoming people. Now, five years was enough for me to uh, learn the language, get to know the people, go into all these remote communities and, and actually learn their culture, plus get and making friends. And once you get close, you realize how welcoming and, and warm these people are. I have traveled in quite a few parts of Asia, but I've never seen a culture that embedded in religion and tradition. Almost on a daily basis, Balinese people are so devoted to religion and, and culture, which is beautiful. Like, like it's a huge part of traveling is to actually understand the local customs and, and the, um, the local ways of living. So Bali is an awesome place for that. This, this love for culture and tradition is also depicted in in their um, in their uh, in their buildings, in their structures. I I don't think I have ever seen a wall without some mural or some um, some carvings on it. Like there's nothing plain about Bali. Everything has art in it. So that's the cultural side I fell love with. So for the for since um, 2015, I have been to Bali over about. 30 times now and um, uh, or about 20 times rather 
Um, and I have been lucky to travel in every corner of this beautiful, beautiful island. So the our topic, Island of Gods, that's that's very commonly used for Bali because of the devotion for gods and um, and and religion. Out of all of Indonesia, Bali is the only predominantly Hindu culture. Um, everywhere else is he predominantly Islamic. So um, so there's a huge the gods play a huge part of the culture. So it's actually called the Island of Gods. Mm -hmm. Now I'll take you through a journey of what you what if you go there, what you see. Um, and our journey will start out in the ocean. Bali, or that part of Indonesia, falls within the region what's called Wallachia. Now, the Wallachian region has the highest diversity of marine life anywhere in the world, uh, especially the coral diversity. It's an absolute playground. If you are into snorkeling or diving, or if you are into anything underwater, it's an absolute awesome place to visit. Um, some of the coolest things you'll see around uh, um, are the oceanic mantas. Now, pretty much every trip we see a lot of these guys. They are they are fairly common. You can actually easily see them even on snorkeling. You see them, and um, and what what a what a what a view! It's it's just they they look something from outside this world. If you are lucky, you'll also get to see one of these guys. Now that is a uh, oceanic sunfish. They are the largest bony fish in the world. The largest fish is the whale shark, but the largest bony fish is these guys. They go about four me four meters across. It's a wow. yeah yeah. It's a it's a um. They 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 look like aliens. They they are absolutely yeah. strange. In there's a couple of places in Bali where you can see them, but they are very seasonal. So they only come from the deep ocean to the shallow ocean cleaning stations only part of the year. Uh, only for very few weeks, um, but if you if this is in your wish list, Bali is a place where you can actually um, have a good chance of seeing one. How but big do manta rays grow, uh, Doctor Ru? Sorry to disturb. Uh, so there's two uh, two different types of mantas. You have the oceanic mantas and the reef mantas. What you get around Bali and Komodo are the reef ones. Um, they grow about two to two and a half meters across. Still massive, like that's a massive animal. Um, the oceanic mantas are way bigger. Um, so you, but for me, uh, what interest in the ocean is is a completely different set of things, and and this is part of that, the sea snakes. Yes. No one has actually done any surveys on sea snakes around Bali. Uh, my hunch is that we have at least about seventeen different species. Now, sea snakes are the only truly marine reptiles in the world. There are at least about seventeen groups of reptiles that have gone to the marine world. But only sea snakes can complete their entire life cycle in ocean without coming ashore. Turtles come to nest, uh, Komodo dragons, uh, marine iguanas, they all come ashore. These guys are live bearers. They give birth to live young and uh, and they suck at like walking on land anyway because they have this fringe. They are very flat bottom and mm -hmm. they can't if they beach wash, they die. So. So far, I think there's about 17 species of sea snakes in Bali, but um, no one has actually studied them. Um, there's another sister group to that, which is called the sea crates. Now, I have so far recorded three species of sea crates from Bali, um, and the chances are we have another species uh, close coming close to Bali. Now, these guys are quite different. They during uh, daytime, they actually early morning they come to the land, and okay. All everything that they ate, the fish, they digest using the heat, especially under rocks. So they spend the daytime under rocks using the heat to digest. They also lay eggs on land. Um, we found this specimen, uh, Laticoda laticodata, which is a blue lip secret uh, last year, which is a new record for Nusa uh, Penida. Uh, while while under it was un inside a rock cave, like where I'm sta standing there. Now. These are fascinating things. We don't know much about the marine uh, snakes in that region simply because no one has actually studied, but it's also a bit hard to study. Um, but there's one snake that we can uh, relatively easily study, and that's these guys. Now, south of Bali, there are quite a few places where there's very lush seagrass beds, and these seagrass beds are home to um, a very special snake called the little file snake. Um, this is Rehan. Um, he helps me doing this is my son who's um, who's eight now and he comes with me for field sampling. 
and wow. we go around. This is one snake that I let him catch in the ocean. Uh, it's actually non-venomous. Everything else is venomous. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But as you can see, the it's lush grass beds, amazing life there. And you can, if you're, if you're, if you can even do basic snorkeling, these are things you can see around Bali. Yes, um, sea turtles, uh, like as in everywhere in tropics, you get sea turtles there. Um, there's at least five species. We know that there's five species nesting there. We know that at least one more, the flat pack turtles come close to Bali. I have never seen one in, in the shows there. Um, but um, there are quite a few remote beaches where you there are turtle conservation projects happening and these guys are nesting. Now, Part of exploring the oceans around Bali is the fascinating, um, strange things that you see. And so one thing like that happened last year. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris, was diving. This is a very popular dive plot. In I have pretty much every my all my trips I have dove here. Uh, it's called USS Liberty. It's a it's a shipwreck. Um, it yeah. goes quite deep, about 25 meters. But um, okay. these they found an Asian water monitor hunting in this wreck about 10 to 15 meters underwater. Now that is fascinating. These are behaviors that we had no idea of because of the bubbles that all the divers are creating. Oh. There are air pockets. So these guys using those air pockets to breathe and go further, further and in and hunt fish there. So this is the this is the marvel of nature because we, we see these random things that are so fascinating and that we never actually thought of. So uh, Chris and I wrote about this uh, for herpetological review because this is not something we knew about these species that can do, that they actually hunt in the ocean. Um, yeah. If you come a bit closer to land, um, quite a f there's quite a few places in Bali where there's um, uh, mangrove cover, especially in Nusa Chenengan um, and Limbongan, two, two of these small islands. Mangroves have been widely cleared around in Bali, so we don't have much left but uh, in mainland but uh, especially in a place called Sanur there's a lot of uh, revegetation happening at the moment. Now mangroves are home to a completely different set of reptiles and other animals that are adapted to live in this hypersaline water and um, among them are the saltwater crocs. Oh. Uh, salties um, for the last about six or seven years every year uh, our local colleagues have actually got salties around Bali. We have not found a nest yet, um, but chances are they are nesting. Some of these are naturally occurring ones. Some of these are escapees from old collection, but um, um, salties are there, but in very few numbers. They are not no way close to uh, what you get in other islands in um, in Asia. Right. So if you leave the ocean, that's that's a very glimpse of what's found around Bali, but there's so much more like b fish life, especially what you get there is absolutely amazing. If you come a bit inland, the three islands that I mentioned, I told you that uh, there's a, a set of islands called the Nusa Islands. Those yeah. islands are limestone islands, so they they are completely different. They're, they're not very rich soil. They, um, they don't have much fresh water and they have these massive cliffs, as you can see. Um, you don't get the idea till you're actually there. I climbed down this with a couple of local kids and far out, they are actually, they're like the wall in um, in Game of Thrones. It's, as you can see, this massive, yeah. it's absolutely tall. And this is the safety standards there. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool though. Like yeah. I love this kind of traveling where you go with the locals and experience these hidden spots. These are not yeah. open for tourists most days. Um, but, that's Nusa Islands. Uh, so Nusa Island is not very diverse because of that, like um, uh, diverse when it comes to animals, simply because there's not much fresh water, plus uh, the vegetation is quite sparse. But Bali, I told you at the beginning, uh, it's a volcanic island, so it's very, uh, it's very uh, nutrient rich soil. So it's very, very highly lush. Treated, yeah. very lush. But unfortunately, because Bali is also one of the most populated islands in Indonesia, um, the the primary primary forests are extremely rare. There's only a couple of mountain tops with primary rainforest or primary forest for that matter. Everything else is secondary or or mixed of home gardens and everything. Um, if you if you look Bali from above, this is how you see it. It's it's hugely fragmented. 
there are so many roads and paths and paddy fields and um, and all kinds of agriculture uh, bisecting this land um, so th there is green but this green is very very fragmented and blocked now as an evolutionary biologist this is also very fascinating for me because one of huge huge part of my research group's work is based is looking at how animals adapt and this is a natural lab for us because we this is an amazing place where a huge population of humans co-occur with a quite a diverse group of animals right so we our work there has been largely looking at how these things adapt to live in these um, in these disturbed habitats now i'll show you some of my favorites there and um one of the one of the fly that's like the two wings um uh, Kenneth recently put this uh, pretty amazing document just to show the diversity of species around that area um, in Indonesia. And as you can see, there's so many dracos, and most of these are, are um, they're, they're disexual, so the males and the females have different colors. Um, mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's it's pretty amazing. Pretty much every island has its own thing. So. Bali, we know that there's records of three species, but Volans is very, very common, um, which is this species. And common. That's, yeah, that's the most common uh, form of uh, flying lizard you get there, uh, especially in palm trees, uh, coconut trees, even in very populated areas, you actually see these guys. Um, they're pretty fascinating to watch. Um, that's not the only thing that flies there. There's, um, there's also flying snakes. Now, Sri Lanka also have two species of these guys, uh, Chrysophilia. Uh, but Paradisi is a very colorful species. Um, and the coolest thing about these guys is, is like, we know that, the, so there has been quite a lot of studies. We know that the flying lizards, once they take off, they can't change their direction. They just go to the next tree, which makes yeah. sense because all these flying or gliding animals do that to avoid coming down the tree and climbing up again. But for flying snakes or tree snakes, they can actually change the direction of flying while flying. Uh, using their tail. So um, Socha did a lot of work on these guys in Singapore and found some of these very, very fascinating flying behaviors. So yeah, so these are things that you can encounter um, in the um, in very mixed forest, plus even in urban gardens uh, in Bali. But one animal that you can never miss in Bali is this guy. That's the call, Toke. Toke. Okay. That call is so, so obvious. It's one of the most beautiful lizards, uh, geckos out there. It's massive. They're actually quite big geckos. And I have never been to a place in Bali that you can't hear one or see one. They are so common. Even in the high, high mountains, they're actually, you can find them. They're absolutely common. Even in, if you stay in a very fancy resort, any, mm -hmm. most trees in that fancy resort would have toke geckos. They're absolutely common. Very, very fascinating. Are they endemic to uh, Bali? No, they are very widespread. That genus uh, uh, gecko has quite a few species. Gecko smithai, gecko monarchus, um, gecko gecko, which is the toke gecko. Um, and it's very widespread across Asia, uh, across okay. Southeast Asia. Um, the, um, the roadsides of Bali looks like, I don't know if you go to like Kandy or somewhere, it's a, in, I'm just referring to places in Sri Lanka. Um, it, it's very vegetated. The roadside verges in most places, once you get out of the main towns, are extremely vegetated. Now, for a herpetologist like myself, these are amazing places. So, Tumit, my uh, travel partner, and I, when we go, we just get a couple of scooters, which is the easiest way to travel around. And we do spotlighting pretty much every night before we hit the pubs. Um, so, this is... It's an amazing, um, amazing, easy way to find few cool things. And two species you almost every night find are uh, the Dendrolaphids, which is in Sri Lanka, we call them uh, Haldanda, and uh, Ahatulla, which is the wine snake or the um, the genus itself is Ahatulla. Now, these are not the species you get in Sri Lanka, but um, but these two are pretty much dead sure. They, they are absolutely uh, common in roadside plants in home gardens everywhere. And one of the other coolest things you experience during these night tours is the local food. Now, nice. <laughs> over the years, I have actually stayed in the most upper end 
resorts in Bali, like some of the like the top and top end ones. I don't think I ever remember what I ate there because that's it's it's nothing memorable. It's it's another resort. If you are regular, if you are a regular traveler, it's just another resort. But it's these memories, like what you spend in the roadsides with the locals and eat. Those are the memories. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of um, travel, like experiencing authentic local things. And Bali has no shortage of that. The people are welcoming. Um, it's very easy to get around and, um, and experience these things. Everything's fried or with oil or with sugar, which, which makes it even yummier. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's large part of traveling for me, um, going into these rural areas, actually working with the local communities and my local collaborators there and experiencing this. Um, Bali also, on top of vegetation, Bali also have a huge freshwater life. Um, there's, a, there's no shortage of freshwater. Everything from um, uh, creeks and rivers to walk, uh, crater lakes, there's few crater lakes, um, and a lot of, lot of man-made water bodies, paddy fields to ponds. Now these are home to another whole array of uh, reptiles and amphibians. Uh, Bali has one endemic frog and about 15 different other frogs. Uh, the endemism is quite low, but there, there's some cool species. Um, but one one thing that's always cool to see are the Asian water monitors, salvators, uh, Um yeah. Now, not not many people. These these are two of my colleagues, uh, Max and Agus. Um, just to give an idea of the sizes, now the lot not many people know, but the largest ever recorded lizard specimen in the world is actually Asian water monitor from Sri Lanka, uh, three point two meters long. It's in the Paris Museum. So it's not a Komodo dragon or anything else. It's actually one of these. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, the largest known yeah. record for lizard. Um, so these guys, because Bali is also populated, it's also polluted, unfortunately, for uh, around the cities. But pollution brings in opportunities. Pollution brings in a lot of feeding opportunities for animals. Um, so not all are positive, but that's how the nature works. Some animals adapt to live in that environment. And this is one of the most adaptable species. Anyone in Sri Lanka would have seen these in towns, um, especially if you go to fish markets. Um, these guys are absolutely are they the same same subspecies, is it? Uh, same uh, species, is it? Mm. There's taxonomic revision going around. Um, salvator is a very widespread species, but at the moment we consider everything salvator there. Um, and another group are the keelbacks, which are the the water snakes, the freshwater snakes. Uh, we know of three species from Bali. Um, fairly common. You get them um, in paddy fields. They they are a huge part of the food chains there. But there's one one snake that stands out. Now this is a if you if if this is in your wish list, this Bali is a good place to see these guys. Uh, mangrove cat snakes, Boiga dendrophila. Now the as the name suggests, they are they are normally found around mangroves or coastal areas. But Bali has an introduced population in the middle of the island, um, which lives around paddy fields. And they're fairly easy to see. Like I have actually pretty much every night I've went there, I've seen animals. Um, and it's the largest, uh, largest cat snake, which is the group that Marpila belongs to, or yeah. they're commonly called the Marpilas. So this is the largest member of that group. Um, beautiful, beautiful snake, as you can see the colors. Yeah. And yeah, it's there's a there's a creek system and a paddy field system in Bali where you can very actually see these guys. And uh, more or less in the same area, if you go to Northwest Bali, you see, um, you get to see the king cobras. Um, king cobras are the largest venomous snakes in the world. They are, um, uh, just to give an idea of how big they are, this is just a comparison wow. idea. Now that, that photo is from Kerala. Yeah. Uh, we work with a, a, a local a group called the Bali Reptile Rescue uh, to take people seeing king cobras in the wild, um, especially mm -hmm. during the breeding season. Um, and we do it in a very, very sustainable, non-disturbing way. So there's absolutely no handling. I'm putting that photo just to give you an idea of the size. Uh, we don't do any handling of venomous snakes um, during trips, um, but it's an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see, the largest venomous snake in the world, to see one in the yeah, wild. So majestic actually. They're absolutely majestic, and, yeah. and it's one of the very, very few snakes that actually make a nest and guard the guard the eggs. 
So pythons do guard their, they incubate their eggs using a coil, but yeah. only a very, very few snakes actually make a nest. Now, king cobras do that, and in Bali, they breed in, uh, especially in bamboo forests, and they use the decaying bamboo uh, to pile up and lay the eggs in there, and they use the decaying heat to um, to incubate the eggs. Um, so, yeah, this is a, this is a pretty high up in the list for herpetologists that travel in yeah. Bali, and, um, and we have local networks. We have very close colleagues that work on them, that we take people and show them in the wild, you know, in a very non-disturbing, non-intrusive way. Um, so all this, this is just a glimpse of what Bali offers when it comes to herpetofauna. This is, um, it's it's barely anything that I actually spoke, but it's the culture, everything fascinated me a long, like five years ago, it hooked me up. Now, even even this thing, you, you'll see this regularly in, uh, in, in Bali, in, around temples, in villages, and, um, and what it is, it's it's actually one of the Balinese beliefs. It's that the world is on top of a soft shell turtle, which is this one, wrapped around using two nagas, which is two cobras. And all the tremors that you get, because Bali is in an earthquake belt, all the tremors you get is when these animals move. So, so herpetofauna has been quite embedded in the society of Bali, and that fascinated me. And since I went there, starting five years ago, I started photographing and finding about the animals there. And I managed to um, write a bestseller on that. Um, the uh, Reptiles and Amphibians of Bali, which is the most comprehensive book on um, on Balinese herpetofauna. Um, Bali has a lot of hippies and um, and herpers. So yeah, two books became bestsellers. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the second edition just came out. So if you want to uh, uh, we have 137 species included. That's every single species now known from Bali. Um, if you are, if you are, if you want to learn about these guys, this book is available online from a lot of uh, booksellers. Um, now that that's just a very very quick glimpse of what Bali offers for a herpetologist. And I, I merely just spoke only of herpetofauna, but there's so many other things from birding. It's not a huge place for mammal life. Uh, mm -hmm. see, it's a, it's a small town, a small uh, island, as I told. It's like one tenth of Sri, less than one tenth of Sri Lanka in size. So the the large animal diversity is quite low, but birding, um, close to two hundred species, um, which is which is quite amazing. And herpetofauna for an island that small to have about one hundred thirty plus species, that's quite amazing too. And but and the uh, marine life around is just unreal. Um, so that's. That's Bali. Um, do you have anything, Rajiv, to add there? Um, and uh, Dr. Ruai, uh, how easy is it to get to Bali? Like I heard that, there's, that they're encouraging a lot of visitors and uh, with regards to tourism, uh, they've eased up a lot of the restrictions, right? Um, yeah, actually. Uh, so Bali um, Bali is absolutely tourism fr tourist friendly. It's, the, it's, their, it's their main, kind of their main income um, in, a, in a regional sense. So it's it's the system is there, the logistics, everything, and and the good thing is that you can travel from being super luxury to absolute backpacking. So there's options for everything, and the coolest thing is that starting last year, um, they have visa exempted so many countries, including Sri Lanka. So you don't actually need visa; you can just turn up with your passport, right. um, which is, which makes traveling much easier for a lot of Asian nations. Yes. Um, so the infrastructures there. The um, the tourism industry there is largely focused on fun, like it's just a getaway or almost or more recently about yoga, art, uh, meditation, that kind of stuff. But there is a growing wildlife based tourism industry there and quite a few of our colleagues work in, in developing a very specialized herping tourism there, which we which I think we'll talk later. Um, but for us, large part of that is being ethical and sustainable. So, if if you want to, if you if if you are into putting animals in your, around your neck and taking selfies, that's not us. Um, but if you want to actually go out with people who actually do science and learn about things and see them in the natural state, um, there, there are opportunities that we can discuss. Um, so Bali has been very welcoming, um, and I, I, I would it's it's a it's a 
it's an island paradise that you can certainly give a give a good go. Excellent. And uh, I'm the one thing which really fascinated me was the King Cobra because that's definitely high up on my bucket list. How um, how hard is it to uh, get to glimpse uh, such a majestic animal in Bali? Like, is it really tough to find find them? Uh, and when is the breeding season? So, uh, um, so the breeding season starts. Uh, breeding season largely overlaps with the late uh, late dry season. But um, the so as I said, we work with a local group called the Bali Reptile Rescue, um, mm -hmm. and the visits to the areas that you find them, especially when they are nesting, has been quite restricted. As in, we are not okay. taking huge groups, and there's certainly no catching animals and, and posing yeah. with them um, during the particular time. So so far. Every time that someone wanted to travel with us and actually see them, we have been lucky to see them. But one part of tourism is that now I know that in Sri Lanka, wildlife tourism largely refers to photographing elephants, to bears, to large mammals in safaris. This is a completely different thing. This is a completely different type of wildlife tourism. Um, this is on foot. It's there's absolutely no assurance for anything. Uh, you are talking about wild animals. If you want to assure to and see something, you should go to a zoo. Um, of course. We, are, we are talking about wild animals um, and especially reptiles. So they are cryptic animals. But um, the group that we work with are among the top specialists in that field, in that island. So your chances are highest with, with traveling with that group. Um, but so far, as I said, we have been lucky to see um, King Cobras every tour or every trip uh, that we did with the uh, Bali Reptile Rescue. But that no way is an assurance. Um, but but you have a very high high chance of seeing them in Bali. Good chance. Yeah. Yeah. And are, are they uh, different? Uh, uh, are, is there some distinctive uh, features, or the, are they different uh, to the cobras you get in mainland India, or uh, they're the same? same Interesting. Uh, um, yeah, at, at this stage, every um, um, all the king cobra species across their range is uh, categorized as one of your figures. Hana, of your figures, just the name itself means snake eating because they eat other snakes, including like yeah. small pythons and all that. Um, yeah. So, but I know that uh, Rom Whitaker was recently in Bali looking at a, doing a uh, uh, doing a survey of uh, because you get them from mainland India to Andamans to Thailand to. Um, to Bali, and I have seen king cobras in about four, um, about four or five countries now, and some are actually quite different. Like you can, you see them, you you see the differences. Like uh, a king cobra from Malaysia, like Malaysian mainland to Bali, it's quite different. Um, so I'm I'm pretty I'm not a taxonomist. It's not an interest of mine. A new species or or like the taxonomy part of animals. Uh, I'm more I'm more fascinated by behavior and adaptation and kind of stuff. So I don't know the exact of what where taxonomy is at the moment. I know that it's only one species, but I don't know how close we are into splitting them. But I know that uh, Rom's group and at least another group is actually looking into it. OK, and uh, when it comes to uh, the sea snakes and uh, uh, seeing them in the ocean, uh, you, you need uh, to do scuba. Or can you manage with snorkeling? Um, so sea uh, sea crates are really easy to see in parts of Bali because they come ashore. So you can um, in the late night, late evenings when, especially around Sanur, when you uh, it's a beach in southwest Bali. Um, if you walk, you see them coming out of the the rocks and actually slide into the uh, to the ocean. And mm. uh, by snorkeling, I have seen them in quite a few areas, especially around Crystal Bay, um, Nusa Peni, uh, Nusa Dua, Benoa, quite a few like southern parts of Bali. You see them while snorkeling. Sea snakes are tricky. Large, large part of why we don't know anything about sea snakes because is we don't we rarely see them. Um, most sea snake records are coming from fishing, like uh, accidental captures in fishing boats. So, um, so unfortunately, um, we sea snakes is not something that you commonly see in Bali compared to like the Great Barrier Reef, for example, in Australia, like. Olive sea snakes are fairly easy to see there. So are the, uh, a few other species. Um, we have done spotlighting on boats at night time, which is a which is a relatively easy way of seeing sea snakes because they they come to the surface at night time and they rest on the surface. And because they are lighter in color, you can easily pick them from the color. 
Um, that's one way of seeing them, but still very few numbers. See crates, fairly easy to see. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Ru. So it's been it's fascinating to see the diversity and it's uh, from the oceans all the way to the mangroves and uh, even inland. And yep. uh, it's some definitely uh, if you're into herping, it's one of the uh, key places I would say, uh, especially to go with uh, the experts who you work with uh, would be a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I'll, we'll have a quick look at uh, 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 the other part, which is Komodo. Yeah. And um, so I. So I, I told that Bali is a small island, right? I told that it's uh, it's less than one tenth of Sri Lanka. Yeah. Now that's Bali. Next to Bali is Lombok. Now between Bali and Lombok, there's a very, very deep trench. We that's like in evolution in biogeography, we call it the Wallachian line, the Wallace line. Okay. Now the 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 Wallachian line differentiate uh, two evolutionary lines. Everything from this side has a mm. Asian origin, and quite a lot of things on this side kicks in with an Australasian origin. So mm. uh, compared to these gaps between other islands, this is a huge, huge deep trench. So a lot of things. Uh, in biogeography, we actually this is a very important place. If you go from Lombok, then you have Sumbawa, which is a very strange shape island, and then you have Flores. Flores is a pretty long island; it's only part seen there. Between Sumbawa and Flores, you have this set of islands, very small. Now, imagine like I told, Bali is one tenth, and look how small these islands are, right? That's where Komodo National Park is. Now, I first went to Komodo uh, about three and a half years ago. And this was a long, long interest of mine. I since I read, um, I, I remember watching David Attenborough had a, a, a TV series called Sequest, his first TV series. And in that he shows where he go, how he goes to Komodo and catch a Komodo dragon. Since I saw that as a kid, I have been so fascinated about these dragons. So this is something I always, always wanted to see and go and do some working. So that came to a reality about three and a half years ago. And since then, I have gone there about three times every year. So I've been there more than 10 times now. And how you go is like you, you go to an island, uh, to a uh, town called Labuambajo, which is in Flores. So this is Flores. And then you jump in a boat. And um, and explore these islands. So there's three major islands: Komodo, Rincha, and Pada. And there's so many small islands scattered around. Now, um, is it okay? So the um, the first uh, this so the first time I went to Labuan, everyone when they are first go to a place we take a that's our normal thing here like we take a photo of the uh, photo of how we went there so you go and jump on a there's a lot of uh, local operators wings air lion air uh, garuda quite a few people fly there you go to labuan bajo and then you jump on a boat and then you start exploring now the um, the when i first went there i went with a fishing uh, like a fisherman i jumped mm -hmm. on a fishing boat and try exploring these places. Now, fascinatingly, he took me to his village. Um, this is Misa Island, which is uh, which is occupied by the Bajau people. Large part of my travels, I love experiencing these remote communities, these remote cultures. For me, that is so fascinating. Like I like, I like animals, uh, especially reptiles. I absolutely love human culture. Um, so I spend the night in this island. It's a it's a very small fishing island, and these are the Bajau people. These guys, these kids, grow up in the ocean. They are mermen and mermaids. Like I yeah, challenge one of these. Oh, I challenge one of these kids for a free dive. I made a fool out of myself in front of that village. They <laughs> they they are born in the ocean. They oh my god, they can dive. So. Um, so it's absolutely fascinating experience uh, visiting these places and the fish because these guys live in the ocean. Literally, the amount of the diversity of fish eaten is just absolutely amazing. There's fresh seafood. Um, so 
Komodo is a completely different experience because Bali, you, you go, you get a scooter or you jump on a car and you explore. Komodo, exploring Komodo is a completely different experience. You go in a fishing boat or you, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, we, we, when I go, I love going with fishing, fishing uh, fishermen. But when we take people, we, take, we, we get luxury um, liverboard boats. But you, you have the whole spectrum. You can do whatever you want. But uh, yeah, you, you just sip a Bing Tang beer and, um, and enjoy the sunset. And you wake up in a deck of a boat like this. It's just absolutely amazing. You have, sometimes you have the whole place for yourself. Um, so these islands comprise the Komodo National Park. You can anchor there at nighttime. And so you go there in the evening, you anchor there. And the next morning you start exploring. Now, compared to if you remember what I told about Bali, Bali is very lush. Komodo Islands are quite the opposite, right. where they're very dry. There's hardly any standing fresh water. The fresh water is com- almost all from uh, rain. Um, there's only very few natural uh, uh, natural fresh water bodies. Um, it's very grasslandy. You have palm trees. All the gro- all the low lying the valleys have the vegetation where the water strands. So the the structure of these forests are quite different. There are cloud forests known from the high top ends here. I have never been to one. Uh, Ofban, who studied this system in the 1970s, wrote about those things. It was a it's a it's a plan of mine to actually explore those because there's a couple of uh, lizards and and frogs only known from those cloud forests in these teeny weeny islands. Um, I, I still haven't had the chance to do that, but it's in my list. Um, but like the name suggests, uh, the land of dragons, why the biggest trump card there are the Komodo dragons. That's my yeah. first ever encounter with a dragon. Since oh. then, I have seen hundreds of them. It's um, the first one always stuck. It's just absolutely gorgeous big animals. You don't appreciate the size of them till you actually stand next to one. Um, these are these are only found. So there's a population found in mainland Flores, but all the other the big populations are in the islands of uh, Komodo and Rincha. Um, so when you think of the bigger picture from the whole world, they are only found in a very, very small part of the world. Right. And um, they are not hard to see at all, like in the correct time, um, they are actually fairly easy to see. So if you go to the, if you visit these islands, you are almost assured to see um, the Komodo dragons. Whenever they are not making love like this, um, they go around hunting and killing things. And um, last year I published a paper with uh, Professor Rick Schein looking at how these guys would have evolved here because it's it's fascinating, like we, when you think of evol- uh, extinction of reptiles, a lot of these large um, animals have um, have ex- gone extinct in um, small. Li- all the large reptiles have gone extinct in small islands. Now right, okay. the Komodo dragons, like all the megafauna that lived in the same time, have gone extinct. But Komodo dragons and um, and uh, uh, Galapagos giant tortoises are pretty much the only large animals surviving in small islands. So we had a review last year as to how this is even possible. And we that paper is available on my personal website if you go to the publications things. And you can, um, it's a fascinating read about how marine subsidies to a lot of other things would have helped. Mm. Now these guys mainly eat all the introduced uh, animals. There's introduced buffalo, uh, 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 there's uh, wild boar, uh, timo deer, and they provide most of their food. Now, um, also a few years ago, there was also a fascinating uh, publication look, uh, saying that no, it's not it's not just the trauma and the bacterial action of their bite that kills these buffaloes. They actually have a rudimentary venom gland. Now, this is this is a this is a game changer in um, in reptile evolution. Um, because now we know that the Varanidae or the, the family that goannas and monitor lizards belongs to actually have these, uh, these rudimentary glands. Now, this is like the biggest reason why people go to Komodo to see the yeah. dragons. But for me as a herpetologist, there's more to Komodo and, um, and Rincha and the Komodo National Park than just dragons. 
And one group that I'm absolutely fascinated about are the 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 pit vipers. So um, uh, OK, I need to apologize. That's not the actual name. So Trimerosaurus insularis is the name. It's not Ablorabis. Um, okay. So that's a mistake. I'm sorry. Um, so this guy is very widespread. You see this species all across pretty much all like from Java to most of those islands. Mm -hmm. But something funny happens in just Komodo drag Komodo Island. Now out of the whole range, just in Komodo Island, they start changing wow. color. They become they have this turquoise color sometimes and rarely if you hit the jackpot, you see these guys. Wow. Now, this is the this is the pinnacle in pit vipers like this is the only blue pit viper in the world and out of the whole world it's only found in komodo island which is uh, pretty amazing given how widespread they are and um, um uh, and this photo actually landed me on a on a national geographic um uh, foreign next uh, foreign magazine wow. too because it's such a fascinating thing and for me, it's Komodo dragons are awesome, but um, OK, sorry, I'm getting a message that uh, there's a. Can you hear still what I'm saying? Uh, there was a slight disturbance a little while ago, uh, yeah. but I think uh, right now we are live, so. Yeah, OK, I think we are live, yeah. OK, cool. So um, apologies for that. Um, yeah, so the, the, this is the if you if you are if this is in your list, it is in the list of so many herpetologists. Komodo Island is the only place on Earth to see these guys. Now, um, uh, I, I, uh, I have to be very clear. I have to be uh, I have to be make it very clear that. Not every specimen is blue like this. You have a whole spectrum. There's a the, it goes from green to blue. But um, but hitting something like this is a once in a lifetime thing. It's an absolute, absolute gem to see. Now for me, traveling and doing all this stuff is so cool because um, I get to experience these places. I get to see things that um, that very few people have seen. But for me, a large part of working in these countries, in these places is to the, uh, the privilege to work with local groups. And to learn from the local groups and to and to teach some of the things that I know to them, right? It's a two way thing. So over the years I have had a I have put up a really good team of herpetologists in uh, in Komodo, some very, very capable, knowledgeable local uh, park rangers and guides. So we work closely with them. This is my team. Uh, we have a, a herpetologist scientists from Australia and the UK working with the local specialists and because of our and we do some very cool stuff there. So anyone in this photo would know everything about Komodo up the fauna. So this is our team. Very, very capable. And we are hoping to uh, work out a very special experience next year when things settle down and uh, having Dr. Ru personally guide if uh, possible would be an awesome experience. Uh, but also, as he mentioned, his team are also superbly qualified and experienced to showcase these wonders. So uh, Classic Travel is organizing uh, a group departure and uh, we'll stay tuned and uh, we'll follow our uh, Facebook page and we'll keep you updated. And uh, that being said, uh, uh, there, are, there are several uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm very, very sorry uh, for the delay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ru, for such an enlightening uh, uh, presentation and uh, insight into this amazing uh, uh, land, uh, land of gods and dragons. Uh, there were a few questions um, which were asked by the audience, and one of them was, uh, "What it mean? What the uh, a cryptic animal? What's the meaning of cryptic animal?" Okay. Um, the the word cryptic can be used in different contexts, but um, in this particular talk, I use cryptic in a behavioral point of view. So cryptic as in it's shy, it's not showing itself. So unless you go actively look for it, it's not something that's just run around, run around and see. 
and you, you can see. So I was using that in a behavioral point of view, but you can use cryptic in many other many other contexts. Um, for when you say a cryptic snake, normally it, it's something that's very hidden. It's very shy and um, it's not something that you often see out in the environment. OK, and uh, another question is about the sea crates. How do they differentiate from the sea snakes and uh, uh, they do, do they come to the land to seek warmth? What's the main reason? So that's another question. And also how venomous are they? Yeah, so um, um, uh, as I as I told during while showing the uh, sea snakes and sea crates, sea snakes are very flat. They are highly aquatic. They spend their entire life in the ocean. They give live birth, so they give birth to live baby snakes in the water. Whereas sea crates are oviparous, or in other terms, they lay eggs. So they have to come to land to lay the eggs because you can't incubate eggs underwater. Um, on top of that, they actually on a daily basis, they come to land to digest their food. So in the nighttime, they do feeding. They go and eat all the fish, mm -hmm. come out and um, they digest what they have eaten using the heat of the, the sun. Normally, they crawl under a rock in the beach and use that heat to help them digest and in the evening go back to the water. Now, sea snakes are actually most sea snakes are quite venomous, but it depends on what they eat. So more, some sea snakes are highly specialized fish eater, fish egg eaters. They only eat eggs. So these guys don't have a venom system. They don't need a venom system. Um, but there are most sea snakes are specialized eaters of long bodied fish. So these are the eels, eel like fish, gobies, uh, catfish. So to when you are hunting in a in a in water, the prey can escape in a 3D environment, right? If you're on land, the prey can only la run on land. So it's a 2D place that you have to hunt. But if, right. you are, if you're an animal that eats in the ocean, your mm -hmm. prey can escape into a huge 3D space. So you need some very, very toxic venom to paralyze that prey immediately. So most sea snake venom is myotoxins. They paralyze the muscles so the fish can't swim away. So that's why they have a very toxic venom. They are venomous. Um, people have died from their venom, including in Sri Lanka. But compared to a lot of land snakes, they are timid snakes. They are not aggressive snakes. So being a venomous snake is quite different to being a dangerous snake. So we normally, unless you unless you actually hurt that animal or try handling it, chances of sea snake randomly coming and biting you is almost uh, almost non-existing. Okay, talking about aggressive, another question is uh, about uh, how aggressive the Komodo dragons are and uh, um, well, about, you know, walking with the rangers. Is it, is it, um, have there been instances of attacks? Um, uh, I know of instances of attacks, like uh, there are actually villages in Komodo and Rincha, so there's people living there. So over the years, there have been attacks on, uh, on, on villages. Um, obviously, it's an apex predator in that environment, so it's a large predator. If it feels threatened, or if it feels, um, I don't know of any incident where they actually hunt a human and ate it. Um, but the mostly for self-defense or just being on the wrong place at the wrong time, people have been attacked. But chances of that happening when you're on a, on on a visit is quite low because you are under the watchful eye of um, of rangers. They know how what not to do and how close to get. Um, okay. you, you can't just randomly walk around in Komodo. You have to go with rangers. OK, and uh, also you uh, mentioned that there are small, few uh, animals in the main in uh, Labuan Bajo that main land. Is it or only in Rinka and uh, uh, Komodo do you get them? Uh, yeah, so there's a popular so Komodo dragons used to be widespread. So I uh, in one of my papers, we actually describe how it even Australia had Komodo dragons. So the yeah, yeah. So it used to be a widespread species, uh, the the ancestors of them. Australia is like they, Megalania, right? Who was, yeah, yeah. Was so there. and but like there was actually a Komodo dragon ancestor there too on top okay. of that. Yeah, so but a lot of those get extinct um with time and uh floras. Now you get a couple of isolated populations south and north of Labuan Bajo. That's in mainland. I have seen one there. Um, but they're, they're they're hard to see. They're quite sparse. Um, the the populations that you can easily see are in the island, so in Komodo and Rincha. And uh, I don't know. This is just some review, like you know, you get uh, 
travel reviews. Uh, Rincha seems to be easy to get to than Kamod. Is that correct? Uh, um, not really. Rincha is closer to uh, Labuan Bajo, so you can get there easy. So you, if you are just doing a day trip, uh, most day trip operators would take you to Rincha because you can go there in a day, spend some time and come back. Komodo, on the other hand, is uh, further than um, uh, Rincha. So how we normally do it when we take groups is um, you fly to Labuan Bajo, you get onto a liverboard boat, you can get, we, we have access to the whole spectrum from the ultra luxury um, customized service uh, luxury yachts to, um, to fishing boats. Depends on your budget, your interests. Um, and then we do liverboard. So you actually live for the next three days on the boat. Mm -hmm. So you, you travel, you go from island to island, you spend the daytime, you come, you, you have a rest, and then you um, uh, go for nighttime spotlighting, find all the cool things then, come back and you sleep on the boat. So these, these boats are fully equipped with staff uh, cooking everything. Um, it's, it's a unique experience. It's a different type of travel. Oh, okay. That's amazing. And uh, also there's a, a certain time where the oceans are very rough that you can't reach there, right? Absolutely. So it's 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 the it's the equatorial monsoon uh, region. So the the especially the late monsoon. So starting from November till about early March is not the best time to travel anywhere in that part of the world. In a way, it's 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 quite rainy, a lot of floods, rough ocean. So it's not a pleasant time to travel. Um, the mid year. Um, and mid to late year is a, is a around around mid year is a nice time. So much, Dr. Roo, uh, and so much, Dr. Roo, uh, and uh, for all you uh, the audience out there, we hope to uh, organize a very specialized uh, group excursion next year. Uh, it's in the works and we'll update you all uh, on social media as well as uh, individually to all the participants. So please stay, stay connected and stay tuned with us. And uh, Dr. Ru, it's been an amazing honor to uh, have hosted you in this uh, live experience and uh, also to share, for you to share your insights on this amazing land. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, you've done Sri Lanka proud and uh, we we hope that we can uh, you know uh, do some great work here together and uh, thank you so much thank you rajiv and thank you for the team too who's uh, who's behind the screen and um, yeah it's it's been a pleasure and it's always a it's always an honor to work with the uh, fellow sri lankans thank you well, thank you, Dr. Ru and Rajiv. This was an interesting session. I think I speak behalf of all when I say it was quite illuminating. Dr. Ru, a very special thank you to you for being part of this and for helping us make this webinar an absolute success. Finally, we thank all our participants for joining us, for joining with us today. Uh, 2020 has been a bit difficult for travel. However, we are hoping that things will settle soon and travels can um go about exploring once again uh next year we are planning a very unique tour to indonesia as raji said with dr ru himself who will be personally joining us and sharing his extensive knowledge to make the tour experience even more special so do follow our classic travel facebook page and instagram page for updates and more exciting news as we wrap up we wish you all a wonderful weekend Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you.